Welcome inside the brand new Blue Sox Academy here at Sanger Town Square Mall for this week's edition of the Sox Cast with me, Tim Bass, your PA announcer for the Blue Sox. And joining me this week, pitch for the 2021 Blue Sox. And, you know, with the way he pitches, you might consider him a specialist, but you, can, you couldn't deny he was one of the best pitchers in the Sox bullpen this year. Uh, and as you heard preseason and as you're going to hear on this episode of the Sox cast, he is a summer league bet. You name the summer league, he's pitched in it. So joining us now out of American International, sidearm, southpaw, James Flayhive. James, hey, it's about time. And I'm really glad I got you on here, uh, here and now, right? You know, just a few weeks before your season starts. Yeah, we started March 3rd. We go to Florida for about eight to 10 days and I can't wait. You know, we're just grinding next few weeks and uh, I'm super excited. You know, it's going to be my last Florida trip and I got to make my best one, you know, for my last year of playing. So, yeah. And, you know, you're so, I mean, must, before we talk, I mean, obviously, so we know that this past summer was your final summer of summer collegiate baseball, but you had already had, you know, multiple summers underneath your belt and you know it's a who's who of the leagues that you've played in you know you played in the nycbl with the onondaga flames won a ring then you went to the futures league uh with martha's vineyard won a ring 19 you go you go back to the futures league with worcester you win a ring and you talk about you know you were in the necbl as well and then i mean and obviously you came to utica and we'll talk about you know like because after you played in Utica, your summer wasn't over, which well, we don't want to give too much away. But, you know, talk about your just your incredible journey throughout the, the huge landscape that is summer collegiate baseball prior to getting to Utica. I mean, like, coming in, like, I was – it's 2018. I got done with my freshman year of – well, I redshirted my first year. And so it was basically after my sophomore year. And um, it was probably like literally like a week before we were supposed to go down to the NYCBL for Onondaga Flames. And um, I was going to play local ball. I was going to play local ball, maybe work a bit. And that was going to be my summer. And then coach asked me, hey, uh, uh, do you want to play summer collegiate ball out in New York? And I was like, you know what? Um, I thought about it. The facility looked really nice. It was at Onondaga Community College, fantastic fields. Uh, we're living in dorms and it just seems like pretty fun. And I don't really get the, the college experience being a commuter, you know? So I was like, you know what, this, this sounds like pretty fun. And if I didn't have this great of a team that offered, then I probably would have just stayed, stayed home. So I ended up playing there and it, it just became an incredible summer. I mean, like I threw 31 innings with a one, two ERA and I was a setup guy, the eighth, seventh, eighth inning guy throw every day or two and, you know, maybe all-star team and uh, got to play with guys like Nick Garcia, who ended up being drafted by the pirates second round, only D3 player get drafted and just like incredible amount of players end up winning the entire thing. You know, we were, it just, it's huge, not just become a player in the team that won a ring, but be an all-star on a team that won a ring. And that led to an opportunity from an offer from Martha's Vineyard Sharks and the Futures League at the time. So I'm from Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard. I mean, that's a freaking really nice place. So we, I basically got to stay there on a vacation and play baseball for a few weeks. And we ended up going to the championship game and unfortunately becoming co-champions. But um, I got to live at the Vandy house with a couple of the, the players. So it was an incredible experience. And I just, that was just definitely a, a summer to remember. And it just went off from there. And 2019 went to play for the Worcester Bravehearts. So I played there for a bit. And then um, I got upgraded to the NECBL and which I played for the North Adams Steeple Cats. So, um, but uh, Worcester Bravehearts, they won a ring. I didn't get to play the full season, unfortunately, but uh, 
I did get to, you know, I get to play NECBL. I did really well. I had like a one, two, nine ERA for NECBL. I didn't get a ton of innings. You know, they, they threw me in every few games. I threw an inning or two, but um, I did well. And uh, 2020, I signed with Utica Blue Sox, but because of COVID, they had to shut it down. And, you know, I just had to, I play in the Connecticut Collegiate Baseball, just some local decent league. A lot of local players from like the Cape and stuff like that. Their, le- their season got cut short. So we were playing with like guys, like there were teams stacked with like UConn players and just like all the powerhouses, like uh, U-Heart and just uh, a lot of the powerhouse, like D1 teams, just local players, they just played in the league. They didn't really have any options. So let's talk about, you know, how you view coming to the PGCBL. I mean, the NACBL, I mean, that's a legit top five league in the country. So is the PGCBL. So, you know, what were your first thoughts and impressions when you got to Utica? Granted, you were supposed to be there in 2020 before yeah. COVID obviously affected everything. But, you know, take take us back to when you first got to Utica and your impressions of the organization, you know, the city, and being a part of, you know, arguably the – toughest and deepest league um, that you've ever played in the PGCBL? Uh, so perfect game league, it came down and in, it, it was different because the first time living in an apartment uh, or a house with a lot of the players, it was a different atmosphere. You know, we had like five, six guys on the team from, you know, different D1 schools. I'm kind of like the underdog in the team, I think, because I don't really come from a big college. You know, a lot of these guys come from D1s and stuff like that. I'm kind of like the a lot of people haven't even heard of my school. So it's it's nice to just be a sleeper player. But I came to Utica. Everything's within like a 10-minute drive. I mean, you need anything. Everything's pretty close. So, um, and I could say Utica has some of the best pizza, way better than some places I've been to. So, and, you know, we go go to the fitness mill. We get a great workout. I, I love the fitness mill. It's a fantastic place to work out. Um, I don't know. It was just a great atmosphere and everyone wanted each other to get better. And I got to help a lot of players out develop because of my experience. You know, some of these guys, you know, they, they either redshirted in D1 or they got some experience and they, a lot of players had to prove themselves. You know, there's a lot of guys that were like 90, but you know, they need to work on like control and stuff like that and their stuff. So I got to help a lot of players develop. And with me being, one of like probably, I don't know, one of the slower guys in the team, some, it opened the eyes to a lot of players to just um, work on control and knowing you can get the job done. Even if you don't even throw 90, you know, you can, you could still, if you spot up, then you're going to get outs. So it's, that's what I showed for the season, the whole year, you know, just throw strikes, you control your off speed and, and um, you can get the job done. And I really liked my time in Utica. It was definitely a great year. It would have been great to play in 2020 as well, but, you know, the, the time I had there is definitely a good year. So, I mean, let's talk about your pitching style because of the fact, you know, you were on a staff where, you know, guys could, you know, hit 90, you know, some guys even could touch 95. You, on the other hand, you're not one of those guys. You're more of like a control pitcher and you had a different pitching style. I mean, we talked to Figgy a couple of weeks ago where, you know, he was a side armor and, for you, you just essentially the same thing only from the left side and with arguably less velocity. I mean, what's the origin story and how you became a side armor and, you know, um, you know, has that, you know, essentially molded your identity and made you into the pitcher that you are now? So it started at junior of high school. I was thrown over the top. I never really threw that hard. I just, I always threw strikes, right? I always threw strikes. I wasn't really a big strikeout pitcher. I just, you know, I was probably average, maybe above average velocity, probably right in the middle. But it was kind of hittable over the top, you know. Um, I was more of a ground out pitcher. And then, you know, I was messing around with different arm slots, and my ball would just tail a ton. And I just developed a good slider. So it would be the same grip. I had the same exact grip, but throwing it sidearm, it made the ball like go away to the right. And it just like, shut down lefties really well the within the first month of me switching my arm slot it was a summer of junior year my junior year of high school only had, had like a five five year a 
you know, when you have like that much of an ERA as a junior in high school, you're not thinking about colleges. You're not, you know, it's going to be really tough to just be a top uh, starter on the team. So like a month in of switching my arms, I went to a showcase. I went to a decent amount of showcases and I got a ton of calls from D3 schools. They really loved me throwing strikes as a sidearm, having pretty good stuff. And just one showcase at AIC, I had the probably the best outing of the year. I just felt like everything was working for me. I could spot the ball wherever I wanted. I'm like, well, um, and they just, they love me. They wanted me to be initially a lefty specialist because I never really like threw that hard. You know, I was probably max at 78 there. And, but I just had the stuff that they really liked. You know, it's hard to find a, a, a decent sidearm lefty. I feel like every team needs one, you know? So you just go in against lefties. And that was initially my job was to just be a sidearm lefty that threw strikes. And I proved effective against righties and it just carried on from there to be just a regular reliever, just to, just to shut down innings. So, you know, most people, especially opponents would probably classify you as a junk ball pitcher, but I feel like for a guy like you, you probably must take that as a compliment. I mean, like, um, I, I mean, I didn't develop my splitter until sophomore year of college. And I was mainly off speed, but um, because of tools like Rapsodo, it really helped me identify that I had a really high spin rate. I always thought, you know, with the stuff I had, just locate the ball low and you'll get a lot of ground balls. I realized that I had a spin rate of 2100, 2150, I think up to 2200. And I started throwing more fastball up, fastballs up. And the ball would just rise and tail to the left. And it was really effective. So that realized to me that I could power guys with my fastball and they'd have a hard time hitting it. So that helped realize, you know, just the I can work however I want. I could power off speed and I could power, you know, some high strikes early in the count and then go in with my slider and, you know, work on tunneling some pitches. And, you know, there's some realizations you may not have realized that just really help out your, your skill sets. So that, that stuff really helped out. So now I know you, you know, had a lot of summer ball experience under your belt, but in terms of coaches that helped your own personal experience, you know, where do Dougie and uh, Nola Freeman, who is your actual pitching coach, I know Dougie was the manager, but he has a pitching coach background. I mean, where do those two guys rank in terms of how, how good they were progressing you um, with, you know, developing your arsenal, so on and so forth, compared to your other teams? Well, Doug was a head coach, but he was huge on pitching. I, I think he used to be the pitching coach, didn't he? Yes. But yes, he, he was. was. He was massive on pitching. Uh, he knew that as soon as I had my first few outings, that as soon as I went out, he said, I had a plan of attacking. Some of these guys, they just go off what the catchers give them. And I just think about, you know, what I really loved about our uh, pitching coach is that sometimes uh, before we would go in, he would tell us, okay, we have a lefty righty lefty coming up and this guy loves to pull the ball, you know? So I would prepare my bullpen according to the next few batters coming up. So first batter lefty. Okay. So I'd have like a simulated game bullpens. I I'd face simulated three batters. So we had a lefty here. Okay, I got a pound outside slider. Okay, you know, just do like working counts. So I'll do an outside slider, fastball in, and then say, you know, if there's strikes, I'll do a slider just out the zone for a swing and miss. And then, you know, just righty. Okay, I got to do two seam away. Um, and then maybe like two seam outside corner. And then maybe like slider in. And if that's too far in, I'll just power four seam up in the zone. So a lot of that stuff I hadn't really worked on before from other coaches. And that helped me realize and prepare that when I go to the game, now I've already put these repetitions in and I'm just repeating what I just did. So stuff like that, extremely helpful. And many other coaches didn't do that at all. And Doug really likes the, the mindset I had going into the game. It's a big mental game rather than just physical. 
Yeah. And, you know, I mean, obviously there's a reason why Doug is, you know, continuing to rack up wins. He's already 54 and 33 in his first two seasons and obviously going to be managing the team yet again this year. But let's talk about, you know, this, you know, the home stretch in the second half. I mean, you were arguably the best guy out of the bullpen. I mean, I believe your ERA at one point t- towards the end, it was like 0.69, um, which I know for certain reasons. And, you know, like we don't want to like give it away. I know you posted on Instagram because of, I mean, I don't want to give it away, but we all know why. Let's, so that second half, obviously, you know, you're one of the best arms in the bullpen and you're in the middle of a race to win the central division championship that last week of the season proved to be a big deal. And to start that week with, as we get a surprise cameo, (laughs) we're keeping that in there because we need like, again, the Sox cast is wrong. You never know who and what's going to, who's going to show up, what's going to happen. But, and speaking of, you know, Dougie, he was managing great down the stretch and it started with that pink night against Auburn. Tell me about the turnout, you know, watching your team dominate in the first few innings and then coming in as part of a really good, you know, trio of guys that came out of the bullpen um, to hone it, hold it down and win 12 to one to take back first place temporarily in that game. Yeah, I mean, that was a huge event because it was a pink in the park day. You don't want just like an average game to happen. I mean, it's really or a big loss. I mean, that's the last thing you want, right? So you wanted a really exciting to watch game. And, um, you know, uh, I had my parent. my parents got to come down a decent amount of the home games. And it was, it was a fun, you know, like, like wearing the pink uniforms. We had like uh, pink uh, eye black on. It was just like a fun, it was a fun event. It was an incredible game. And I think I got to pitch that game. I don't remember yes, too much of it. I think I pitched an inning or two. I think I did pretty well. Um, but yeah, it was a really exciting game. And I don't know, I just had a blast. There were just so many games over the season that they were just such such memorable. You know, it just wasn't like one super dominant outing I had. I mean, I had a decent amount that just um, – a lot of great memories, you know, just so many summer ball teams I played for. Just, there's so many great games I've, I've played. It's hard to remember them all, but it's, it was definitely, it was definitely a great one. So, I mean, let's, I mean, let's, let's roll with the, in terms of, you know, other memorable games from this past summer. I mean, you don't even talk about, you mean, cause obviously you have a ton of great outings this summer, but what other memorable games really stood out to you um, throughout the course of the summer? Uh, I was, I remember a uh, big memorable game was the, uh, the playoff game. I mean, we were down early because of our uh, starter, but I remember coming in, I think I gave up a few hits and then I just changed my mindset and I ended up doing uh, three innings. I think I had like four strikeouts and uh, I think, I don't think I gave up a single hit after that first inning. And I just, you know, sometimes you go in, you don't have a great start, you know, you give up a few hits, but then you just got to focus on locking back in. And, you know, even after a few winnings, you might fatigue, but I just, you know, I kind of locked back in and they became a lot harder to hit off of me. And I felt like just the playoff games are just the most important. They're just giving our team a chance, you know, because once you get some momentum going, that's when the, the bats start to hit the ball. Because if you have some rough out, rough innings, you know, that bad momentum starts to carry on to the bats. So I remember that definitely. And yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely right when you say that. Um, but I mean, let's talk about the game that were, well, I mean, that the two games that got you to clinch the playoffs. I mean, what ended up happening, I believe when you beat Auburn at home, I believe you were a game behind in the division, but beating them tied, but by win percentage, it put you ahead of Auburn. Uh, but for you, what was it like watching, I mean, a fellow side armor when you talk about Figgy? I mean, you you had some good outings, but, I mean, if there was an outing of the year from anyone on the staff, it had to be Figgy that night against the Double Days. Yeah, definitely. I mean, he had a fair share of good outings, and so did I, because we're just different pitchers. You know, you don't really – you can't really train against hitting against a side armor. So we have quite the advantage – and I got to live with Figgy. So 
you know, two side armors are both weirdos, right? And, you know, I get to help him out because we go through the same stuff, except when I'm just a lefty and he's a righty and he gets to face a ton of righties. I get to face a ton of lefties and we got to help each other on different things. He, he was a bit younger than I was. So we had different maybe interests and stuff, but, you know, we got to help each other out and really develop because it's hard to train a sidearm guy. So it really takes that special person to, to really do that. Yeah, and it's it's great that, you know, you took a lot of guys under your wing, you know, that, you know, could, you know, hit the 90 to 95 range. And, you know, you 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 were obviously great in that. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, this is going to sound like a corny transition, but, you know, you put up some video game numbers, you know, in terms of your ERA. And speaking of video games, um, I got to know this, you know, as I got to know you more throughout the summer, but. You're a big video game collector. It's not just, you know, one console. It's across the board, even dating back to consoles that came out when you and I weren't even alive. So tell, tell the people at home about that and real, and, and before we were recording, but you know, you're telling me about all these other collections that you got. Yeah. I mean, I've always been a collector early on. Like my, I first started collecting Pokemon cards when I was little. And then I went to like Yu-Gi-Oh and then baseball cards was big for a while. And then I felt like I wasn't really too happy with those hobbies. I was just buying boxes of packs and then opening them. And then I just wanted more boxes, you know? So I started collecting. I was in sixth grade. I was like 12 years old. And um, I started collecting video games because I sold my old Pokemon games. And I just wanted to play. It's all I had was uh, a Game Boy. And I just played those games. I wasn't really liking the, the newest, greatest stuff. I kind of wanted to play games that were similar to the original Pokemon games, like the, the older ones. So I started getting into games that came out in the 90s and 80s. And I started garage sailing. I started riding my bike around town with, you know, $10. And I come back home with a, a backpack full of games. This was starting in 2007, 2008. And me having ADHD, I just hyper-focused on that hobby and it just became a collection of over 2000 video games. Um, about, you know, probably seven, eight years later, I'm still adding to it, but um, because of the market has been crazy, I've been, I've been selling a lot of it. So I've, you know, I had a complete N64 collection. I had about 450 Super Nintendo games, probably about 350, 400 Nintendo NES had a pretty big Sega Genesis, Sega Saturn, math, every console that came out, I, I was big on a lot of RPGs and stuff that were similar to Pokemon. So, and then those games became really expensive down the road. So I just, I got on early, like a lot of games I got for like 40 bucks. Like that's what they were worth. You know, five years later, they'd be like $300. So I kind of got on the train a little bit early and um, it's, it, it became a big hobby. And then about 2018, I started getting into streetwear and um, like shoe collecting because it was kind of like, I don't know, I was kind of contempt with all my games and I'm always looking to be busy and looking for the next best thing and just following what my passion and um, interests are. So I started getting into Supreme in like 2018. I started getting into botting and taking it seriously, going for every drop in 2019. Um, to the point where I'm spending, you know, maybe a thousand dollars or more per release every week. You know, some weeks, like two weeks, I'll get like 40 tees. And then I've developed a network where um, I'm associated with like three, four different stores where I'm a supplier for them. So sometimes I just cash out big and I do really well and I get to keep and wear whatever I want, really. So um, I get to hit every release I want and it's just super exciting every single week something comes out. So I'm, I'm really happy. I would definitely upgrade my wardrobe. I used to just wear baseball tees every single day and a baseball cap and just wear gym shorts. And because of this, I, it's really helped out just the stuff I wear and just become, I don't know, more adulty, I guess, just not wearing baseball stuff all the time. So definitely more fashionable. I think that's, that, yeah. I think that's probably the best way of putting it, but you know, you talk about Pokemon, and I think that's a perfect segue, because Pikachu 
your Pikachu became a big <laughs> part of post-game victory celebrations. Where did that come about? And I heard it was really spontaneous, but, you know, what was it like seeing the all of your teammates kind of, like, rallying behind that, like, you know, player of the game gets the Pikachu? Yeah, it started in 2018 with the Onondaga Flames. If you check out um, their social media, a lot of the interviews, they would, like, hold it up as, like, a microphone, and we would, like, throw it at them, and they would just hold it the entire time. And it just became one thing to look forward to. You know, everyone's in their 20s, late teens. Everyone knows Pikachu, right? And everyone kind of likes them. So I kind of brought it to Utica because it's like that one thing to put on the fence. And I'm sure the kids love it, right? Watching the game, seeing a little Pikachu. It's just something that um, it just becomes just like a funny thing. It's almost like a rally monkey in the team, you know, it's just... Uh, you score a run, you bring them out, and then, you, you know, you clap hands or whatever. And it's just one of those things that it's, it's just – you just need something a little bit different for every successful program. It's just like one of those weird things, you know. It's just – but I really liked it. I helped bring it to the team. Yeah, it's of speaking, it. speaking of things that were unique, I mean, you had been – I mean, you've been a part of, you know, teams that had good atmospheres. But tell me about what the atmosphere is like at Mernay. For those that haven't experienced it yet, when you guys get a guy to cross the plate and end or pump it up, goes over the speakers. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's every successful team. They always have that one thing that happens when, you know, the team wins or we get some runs going and it carries momentum. Some other teams, they don't really have that thing. You know, it's like a certain music plays. Um, I remember a team that we would do every time a run scored, we would like, uh, we would, I forgot the song, but we, we would do this every single time. Um, it was just like that thing that got everyone in a good mood because when runs score, you know, you want to be really hyped up. You want to get this good energy going. And you just need something just a little bit different that's great. But playing there, um, you know, I think it's a great stadium to play at. Um, some of the fields, they're not taken care of very well. You know, the benches aren't very good. And they don't really have a lot of fans that create a really great atmosphere. Uh, the fans really add a lot to the players' performance, I think, and just add a positive energy, too. So it just – some guys, they can't really – they can't take playing in front of a few thousand people, but, you know, some players can. They love it. They just love the energy they bring. And, and the food was pretty good, too. You know, we, we would definitely be fed well after the games. So it was definitely a great atmosphere. You know, if, if you're in the fence for playing for other teams or whatever, I think Utica is a great place to play. Definitely don't regret it. I can say that. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about the fact that, you know, after you pitched in that playoff game against Auburn, your summer wasn't over, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, because you drove your car all the way from New York to the to the Midwest to wrap your summer up in the Northwoods. Give me give us that story. Cause I mean, first of all, you know, you start with first of all, how long was the drive? And then, you know, tell us about, you know, what it was like going from the PGCBL to a completely different beast up in the Northwoods. Yeah, it was about a 10 and a half hour drive. <laughs> it was huge. It was super long. The last day in Utica, I had to get my last day experience. You know, I had to go to Slice Pizza. I just had to get my last bits of, of Utica before I had to leave. And uh, it was a one tripper, you know, I, I drove 10 and a half straight hours and, you know, I drove, man, to, I mean, driving during the day wasn't too bad, but when it's pitch black dark out and you have to drive like another four hours, it gets brutal. It gets really rough. And, you know, I'm going to a state I've never been in. I'm, I'm driving through states, multiple states I've never got on before. And it's, it was brutal. It was the, the longest drive I've ever been a part of. Long, the longest I've had was like three and a half hours. I mean, going from that to 10 and a half, I mean, that takes a toll on you. And then at the end, I had to drive, you know, it takes like two and a half from my house to go to Utica. So it was... 13 hours from my house or from Indiana to go to my house. So I had to, I had to stay in Buffalo uh, midway through and then drive from Buffalo to, to Massachusetts. 
So, but I mean, so by the way, the team um, is based in a town called Kokomo. I mean, this is going to sound like such a dad joke, but I mean, and I, and I know we talked about it before, but I mean, I, for me, I would have been disappointed because this, I'm like, that's not, this is not the Kokomo as depicted by the Beach Boys of the 80s. Maybe it's a different, is it the same Kokomo? Because it can't be, no shot. I'm, I'm looking at it. I'm like, there's no way it's, the, I, you know, I, I really enjoy my time in Kokomo because the, the, for the person that thinks of the Northwoods, of course, like 70 plus games plus playoffs, you play every day. And the schedule is just insane. There's not really many off days. And the ones that are off days, they get filled up because of delays. So, but um, you would think it would be like home away, home away. And then, you know, away games are eight hour drives or something like that. But it really wasn't the case. Yeah, your away games are driving pretty far, but you're home for like four or five games, away four or five games, and you stay at hotels. So, and then you get fed really well too. And then, oh, talk about like travel stuff. You know, we get a nice coach bus, but Utica, I want to say has the best travel bus I've ever been a part of. We're talking about a par- like a party bus, like a leathered out. There would be like a fridge in the back. There was like, uh, like a sink. It was just the nicest bus I've ever been a part of. But for Indiana, like whatever Doug or um, the owner does for that bus, keep it up. That's, that's amazing travel. But for, uh, for, yeah, when I was playing for Kokomo, it was long drives, but it was only happening every five days. And we play at some insane stadiums. Uh, my favorite was the Traverse City Pit Spitters. I mean, we're talking about a turfed out, full-blown stadium with like a hotel built into the stadium. It's super like insane stuff. And they fed you super well. Uh, incredible atmosphere. I mean, like the stadium I played at, you know, Kokomo, um, it was, it was an insane stadium too. It was a full turf facility, a uh, stadium, full turf stadium. And, you know, we get thousands of fans every game. And we're talking about guys that are D ones in California, like really good players, like not just like, I mean, they're a top five uh, league in the, for summer collegiate. And I think, you know, all these guys are super amazing players and, they were just like me. They were there like really like the top, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I mean, they were like really good players and really good leagues that had a lot of success. So I just, I got to be a part of them and I was the only guy from the Northeast on the whole team. <laughs> so um, I was just, you know, I had a great experience there. It was a different living uh, facility. You know, we got to, we had host family. And there was like uh, three guys in the team sleeping in the same room. You know, we have a bunk bed and stuff. So it was a little bit different situation. I did like the living situation back at Utica, though, with the, the house. But it was it was definitely a lot of fun. So, uh, so by the way, so I will make sure to tell George, you know, and then thank our wonderful sponsors at Hail Transportation. <laughs> Keep the buses because they're, buses. they're phenomenal. I, I'll make sure to tell George that. And I, 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 knowing, how, knowing how good they've been with us. We'll make sure. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously it, it's, you know, to think obviously, because, you know, as you alluded to, you know, this is your final season of college baseball. Um, so, you know, t- looking back on your entire summer collegiate journey and having it end in Utica in a place where you were supposed to be the year prior. Um, and then obviously, I mean, the fact that your summer didn't end, you went to Kokomo to end your summer. Uh, but, you know, t- you know, Try to put in perspective, you know, the kind of journey that you went on and essentially defining yourself through your experience as a journeyman in all of summer collegiate baseball and a guy who can definitely, I mean, you may not have the tools of, you know, guys that are going to get, you know, you know, like, oh, the Scots are going to clamor over a guy that throws, you know, in the 70s or whatever, they're going to clamor for the guy that throws 90 to 95 and, they can, you know, you can develop him, but, you know, you know, speak to, you know, just the journey that, how that, all of that can contribute to you, you know, like, you know what, people have counted me out for a long time, you know what, I can still prove people wrong at the next level, because I'm not good enough to get there. 
Yeah, I mean, like, I think I topped 82, 83, I think, a perfect game. And, like, even if, um, you know, you reach a certain level where throwing 90 isn't good enough, you know, if it's flat, even for D1 level, especially D1 level. But even at D2 level that I play in, you throw 90 flat, it's going to get hit. And if you miss your spots, they're still in that fastball, it's flat. They know what's coming. But, like, I, I was with my velocity, you know, I don't throw crazy, but I've always been an underdog for every team I've played in. I have always had to prove myself every single year. So some guys that, you know, throw 90 with decent stuff, they don't really have to prove a lot, you know, because they always have to – but, like, a new team, they don't know what to expect from you. They've never seen you pitch. They just – they know that, you know, I'm, you know, maybe low 80s or whatever. And, you know, everyone on the team throws that at least. So as a sidearm lefty, I just, I got to prove myself I'm effective and stuff like that and throw strikes. So it's, but uh, what else do you say? So uh, like in terms of like, you know, just being the underdog and how that you can carry that mentality, even though, you know, scouts are probably not going to clamor over a guy that could only yeah. top in the low 80s and is, a, a unicorn, kind of like how um, Jonah Hill's character and Moneyball characterized Chad Bradford, for example. Like how you can translate that to the next level, you know, and how you can, you know, take everything, all the experience they've had in summer collegiate baseball and obviously at American International and, you know, prove that you can make it at the next level. Yeah, I mean, like even starting out for my college, I was never really a highly – recruited player they didn't really have any expectations for me and I proved to be effective and like um, I was talking to some guys that were d1 they were like you know even if you don't throw hard the stuff that you bring and how effective you were you could definitely play at this level and I just like even when I lived with the the Vandy boys at Martha's Vineyard they were like dude I could I could not hit you at all we're talking about like the best school for d1 that wins world series every year. Like I would be a nightmare facing you. And I'm just a guy that I didn't think I'd be anything too special coming out of high school. I just want to play for my, like my goal was to not play, you know, get drafted because I know I wouldn't be able to, but you know, uh, just to reach a level where it's a different blue Sox team, but it's any CBL. My goal was to just reach that. And I've reached teams that surpass that. And, and that's because of hard work and stuff like that. And, you know, um, just believe in myself that even though I didn't have the stuff, I just, I'm going to work my ass off and I'm going to see where this takes me. And I'm super grateful it's taking me this far. I'd never thought I'd get this far. So it's some guys don't realize that, you know, just because you don't have the stuff or just because you don't throw the hardest in the team doesn't mean you can be an extremely effective play on the team there's a lot of hard work that you can that you can get to get to that level it's a lot of guys that are top dogs in the team just the talent alone didn't get them there it was the hard work that really separated themselves from the others so they, they just don't realize that coming up as a freshman or whatnot you know yeah and again we were really grateful to have a seasoned vet like you you know you, you obviously were great on the field but what you did, you know, helping a guy like Figgy and helping a lot of the other guys like Gio, you know, a fellow New Englander, um, you know, helping him develop and, you know, all the other guys. I mean, you know, you see the guys on Val. I mean, the pitching staff as a whole was really good. And you just happened to be one of those guys that, you know, was really good. And then you helped elevate the level of guys that, you know, have, you know, are at the D1 level. And, you know, they arguably couldn't have, you know, improved as much as they did you know, without your help as well. And, you know, again, uh, and, and obviously you've had the experience to back it up to help them get used to playing in this, especially for the first first year guys who are, this, this is their first summer ever playing summer collegiate baseball. So James, hey, you know, again, you really appreciate you coming on the Sox cast. It was, again, it was about time. Really love you being decked out all in the blue Sox gear, uh, arguably the most fire in the PGCBL. I'm going to put that on the record. I may be biased, but I don't care. But again, really appreciate, you know, you coming on the Sox cast and being the great pitcher that you were throughout the entire summer for the squad. And, and, you know, obviously this is your swan song in collegiate baseball at American international. 
Uh, best of luck. And by the way, um, for those that don't know American International, by the way, you don't need to look it up. If you're an NBA fan, Mario Alley, remember the world champion Rockets and the Spurs, I believe, in 99. He, yeah. he went to American he was, he was in our uh, little Hall of Fame. They have a big banner from at our college. And, um, I believe one of like the he wasn't a coach for the Red Sox. He came from AIC. We're talking about like small players or you know small school but like compared to the big names and coming from our college it's like the college is full of really hard work players and really it's it's a great atmosphere to be in you know it's just not the name of the college it's about the hard work and stuff that are just the college is already an underdog college in the league and we're just you know we're just gritty we're we're grindy we're just hardworking guys so just different experience i think for maybe some other colleges Hey, and I think and the great Jim Calhoun, I think, played basketball at AIC back in the 60s, I believe. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, if you don't know AIC, you better know him now because those guys, of course, uh, our guest here on the Sox cast, James Playhive. James, thanks for the time, man. Again, best of luck in your swan song this year. Thank you, Tim. I really appreciate uh, being on the podcast with you. It's been a great time. So that does it for this week's episode of the, of the Sox cast. Uh, for James Playhive, I'm Tim Best. I'll catch y'all next week with another great guest from our 2021 squad. Take it easy, y'all.